Good evening, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Alford, and it's my privilege to uh, be moderating uh, the panel today. Uh, I want to first, though, commend the University of Hong Kong and the University of Victoria for putting together such a terrific conference. Uh, I was so impressed by what I heard the first day, the uh, keynote by Deborah Brodigam, and then just a terrific panel about debt. I learned an enormous amount. Uh, I also can't resist a shout out to uh, Dr. Uh, Xia Ying, who is uh, someone from whom I learned a great deal during her years as a doctoral student at Harvard. So uh, one, one commendable quality of very well thought out conferences is to put together panels of deeply substantive people around a clear theme. And that's what we have this evening with the panel, this evening, my time, the panel about dispute resolution. Uh, dispute resolution, I always think if thought of carefully, is not so much or only about cleaning up a mess after a problem has arisen, but it's really helping proactively much earlier in a transaction or relationship to structure things in a way that builds trust, exhibits fairness, takes account of difference, evidences transparencies, and builds, um, builds value so that uh, hopefully there won't be a need for a dispute resolution, but if there is, processes have been laid in place when people are on good terms so as to minimize friction when things are less positive. So again, we have a great and varied panel. I think it'd be really hard to find uh, for speakers more expert and more nuanced and happily with at least some differences in their viewpoints. So uh, let me start off. I want to introduce each panelist right before he or she speaks. And our format is our panelists will each speak for somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes. I'll make a few comments, ask a few questions, and then we'll open up for discussion. So our first speaker is Professor Wong Hung from the University of New South Wales, where he is the co-director, professor and co-director of uh, New South Wales Law and Justice's Herbert Smith Freehills China Center, uh, China International Business and Economic Law Center, which is the largest such entity outside of China. Uh, Professor Wong really has an illustrious, uh, long and illustrious career, even though he's still young. Uh, he previously taught Xinan uh, Zhengfa Dasha in, in uh, the PRC, and he's quite a distinguished expert on WTO law, international economic law. He recently won a big prize uh, in international law in Australia. He's won several prizes for outstanding legal research about trade and other issues uh, in China. He was a Fernand Bordel Fellow at the European University Institute. So, uh, Hung, I think we'll turn over to you first to kick off our panel. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Elf, for the kind introduction. And also at the very beginning, I'd like to thank the, uh, the organizers for having me here. Um, so today I would like to discuss about the, the future of dispute settlements under the BRI. Um, and, and also uh, basically I would like to explore the two major questions which I found being very important when we look at the future of the BRI uh, in terms of dispute settlement, but also more broadly about trade investment and other issues. Um, the first question I think is whether there is being an identifiable approach that help us to understand um, uh, China's approach to Belt and Road Initiative, either in Africa or the rest, the rest of the world, because we see that in the context of the uh, COVID-19, uh, it seems to be a kind of the moving targets, the BRI being expanding into new areas, involving even financial area like the digital currency, since we are talking about, you know, for example, digital yuan, but also about dispute settlements, uh, online dispute settlements, but also the issue like where, uh, where to find the, the, the venue for that and how to address that. And also another question I would like to uh, briefly explore is about how do we understand or the new approach of China towards international economic governance if we compare what China has done before in, under the WTO accession. Uh, so for example, um, nowadays we see uh, for dispute settlement and other areas, China, for instance, 
has signed, uh, you know, um, over 200 uh, agreements. Uh, what do I call the primary agreements? You know, those high level uh, intergovernmental uh, agreements with the central and subnational governments, but also with international organizations. And also besides those kind of uh, uh, high level agreements or primary agreements, there are also uh, numerous secondary agreements um, like the performance agreements, financing agreements, and so on and so forth. All of them involves uh, issues like dispute settlements, which are very important. And also at least some of my papers in the following slides, uh, which here, uh, for the reference, if uh, some of um, the audience are interested in know more about that. So firstly, um, uh, I'd like to discuss about the, uh, the BRI and China's approach to the, the BRI. And the first question we have is that, you know, how do we define the BRI? Uh, what I would suggest actually be, uh, it's be difficult to find you know, clear or official definition uh, of the BRI countries or BRI projects, you know, because uh, it seems that they're not currently available. Uh, instead, I think that uh, it may be useful that we use uh, uh, what I propose a uh, 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 kind of the uh, functional approach, which it looks at what are the function of the or purpose of the BRI, including trade, you know, financial uh, aspects, but also uh, people to people uh, movement and increasingly to a broader issue uh, like social, social issues, dispute settlement, and so on and so forth, and uh, to look at what are the uh, essence of the of the activities instead of whether they are special or uh, level in that regard. And and second issue is that um, what are the what are the characteristics underpinning underpinning China's BRI approach? What I would like to argue is that uh, it seems that China has taken a maximized flexibility regarding institutions and norms to address uncertainties or uh, the challenges of the BRI. I would like to give one example for dispute settlement. If we look at dispute settlement, uh, China domestic has taken both domestic and international institutional development. Domestically, we all know that China has de developed the CICC, you know, the China International Commercial Court, and that um, hopefully from Chinese perspective, will be able to address more and more you know, cases, and there are also discussion about whether the CICC will be like, you know, international courts in, in Singapore and Dubai or elsewhere that are able to take cases which are not necessarily uh, directly linked uh, with China. So they are, they are quite interesting uh, domestic institutional developments. And internationally for dispute settlements, there also has been uh, the, uh, the international non government organization on international commercial dispute, prevention and settlement organization. So you see that actually uh, China, uh, these are two examples where you see that China has taken a various approach, you know, by combining ins domestic institution, but also international uh, non-governmental ones. Uh, and also uh, if you look at the uh, rules, uh, China, uh, one example is that China has signed with ASEAN countries, uh, um, associated with Southeast Asia nations on the dispute settlement. And the, uh, uh, the Nanning uh, Declaration focus more on, you know, uh, the adoptive approach of the presumptive uh, reciprocity. So they are, they, they basically the practice seem to be uh, vary according to the partners, you know, or the parties involved in that. And also that will be also affects um, other areas like the secondary project contracts, uh, although many of them are not publicly available. Um, and I think that's been a, how do you understand that? I think there are at least two aspects of that. One is that they may be good in terms of uh, enabling China and error if it is properly managed. Uh, on another side, I think uh, they may have also challenges because that may have the challenges regarding of the predictability. Because if you have, uh, you know, there's no BR wide arrangement about dispute settlement and other areas, instead you have to look at different MOUs, there are over 200 MOUs. And for example, of uh, MOU with one country like Pakistan, they also have a different MOUs, you know, um, uh, signed around different projects. So that makes it difficult to have, you know, predictability or coherence in that regard. Another issue uh, is that also about the transparency. You know, how do you ensure or improve the transparency? Because that'll be very uh, crucial for the dispute settlement, the confidence and, uh, and impartiality of dispute settlement mechanism. And what I like to highlight is also that maximize flexibility is, I think it's be a moving target 
So at the early stage, they use for China to, uh, you know, make the BRM move. But another sign you still have to think about, you know, this because BRM is a moving target. China is being um, ev- practice is fast evolving, so uh, the future of flexibility remains to be seen. They may be hardened uh, in the future. Maybe among uh, smaller countries, uh, uh, a number of countries in terms of the investment trade agreements. So, for example, you already see that China's free trade agreements are incorporated BRI chapter, a chapter on Belt and Road Initiative. So that's a kind of way to see a hardening of the instruments, no longer purely soft, and also um, that happens in the free trade agreements updates with Singapore and other uh, BRI, some other BRI countries. Another question I would like to discuss, and the second, also final one, uh, is about uh, how to understand that. Uh, I think that's been uh, China through the BRI has shown a kind of paradigm shift. Uh, in the past, I like the work of Professor Porter uh, in uh, revealing China's practice in the WTO accession era as kind of synactive uh, uh, do- adaptation approach, which basically means when China joined the WTO, China download, you know, double tier rules, Western dominated rules, and then adapt that to local um, uh, practices. Uh, there are factors, you know, like the um, perception, how, how China perceives the rules, how China sees the complementarity between Western rule and China locality, and certainly the legitimacy, uh, you know, uh, particularly uh, domestic legitimacy, you know, whether the Western rule are being perceived by you know, broader community and trade diplomats and, and you know, uh, professionals in China. And what I would like to argue that for the BRI, I think China's shifting from downloading more towards uploading. So it's kind of through the practices, you know, institution developments uh, and also rules, you know, for dispute settlement, China promotes, um, you know, mediation, you know, one-stop service mediation, uh, arbitration, litigation. Um, and they are kind of uploading uh, uh, China style practice to extra regional level along the BRI through soft law, you know, hard law to some extent, and practices like the the uh, dispute settlement clauses, you know, in the uh, in the BRI project contracts, you know, they may involve issue like applicable law and so on and so forth. Um, and I would like to see that uh, there are substantial changes about influencing factors. Yes, they still have perception, but they also have conception. Uh, which means that you China will tell China story, will conceive new r- rules, new practice, new standards in China's regard. So they may range from you know currency and other areas, you know, uh, technical standards, you know, methods of uh, dispute settlements, uh, online dispute settlements, so on and so forth. Uh, there are a lot of issues like data flow and so on and so forth, and also complementarity also changes in terms of Western law and Chinese localities. The complementarity under synactive reshaping of BRI, I think is about complementarity between China's preferences, like dispute settlement, uh, where China is comfortable with, China's entity SOEs and so on and so forth, with the uh, uh, new rules, new practices, new institutional developments like CICs and others. And finally, legitimacy. They're more about international legitimacy. So a BRI, you know, whether China BRI can be accepted internationally. That's the reason why China ask, uh, you know, you see that the United Nations documents refer to the BRI and so on and so forth. Um, I think they are substantially different from previous synactive adaptation in the WTO era. They like to, to change the international institution and rules in that regard. And I think the fact that we have to take into account is a COVID-19 outbreak, because this will also affect, you know, the factors influencing China's practice, ranging from perception, conception, you know, how you perceive or conceive new rules, given the tensions we face in various areas like trade, uh, debts, and other areas, investment, and also um, issue like international legitimacy, given we have a dynamics in international relations. Um, so I would like to conclude this by saying that actually the BRI, I think is a, a, a huge uh, impact on global economic governance, uh, not only for this settlement, but for other areas. I will stop here and look for more uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wong. Uh, You packed an enormous amount there into a short period of time. So our next speaker is Professor uh, Wong Kidane. And uh, Professor Kidane is a professor of law at Seattle University School of Law. And he's also principal of the Addis Law Group, LLP, a boutique 
law firm specializing in international arbitration headquartered in Washington. Uh, he is uh, author of China Africa Dispute Settlement and many books and law review articles. And he brings to this not only his academic perspective, but um, uh, rich experience representing uh, African governments and many private companies in all manner of arbitrations. Uh, I believe over 45 of them, very impressive. Investment arbitration, commercial arbitration, state to state disputes, the whole works under all kinds of different arbitral body rules. Uh, he, prior to his own firm, uh, practiced with a couple of very distinguished law firms in Washington, DC as well. Uh, so, uh, Professor Kidani, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Alfred, and that's a very kind introduction. Uh, so, in the next uh, 10 minutes that I have, I'll try to discuss trends in China Africa investment and commercial dispute settlement. Uh, this is my own reckoning of. Uh, the, the existing reality and what is likely to happen. And I am uh, highly uh, impressed by Professor Wong's presentation as to how he conceives of what is, what is now existing and in the trends as he sees them. Um, and now I understand Professor uh, Alford's uh, initial comment about the existence of perhaps some uh, level of divergence in our opinions as to what the trends look like. So, China and Africa have essentially inherited the international arbitral legal infrastructure built in the post-World War II period. Uh, partly these, these, these infrastructures were partly built for the purpose of bridging the developmental gap between the judiciaries of the more advanced economies and those who were not as advanced at the time. So, Although uh, China and Africa were, I, I can describe them to be marginal players in, in the making of these institutions and in, in, in legal uh, frameworks. And China and Africa are now using the same rules and some of the same institutions uh, with certain modifications to resolve their disputes. So there is, in my opinion, no appreciable deg degree of departure from these rules and traditions. Uh, if anything, the trend seems to be in the direction of adopting to the more matured, more traditional Eurocentric systems and frameworks. So in this presentation, I will demonstrate this by reference to the, uh, the African, the Continental Free Trade Agreement area and BRI proposals and China's approach to the ISDS reform, the Investor State Dispute Settlement Reform and some of the new cases that we've started to see uh, between Chinese companies and African states. So the uh, Continental Free Trade Agre Agreement area in a BRI, the newly adopted uh, Continental Free Trade Area, seeks to dramatically increase uh, intra-Africa uh, trade. So one of the most serious problems, obstacles, is the, the physical infrastructure. So the infrastructure gap in, in Africa is estimated at hundreds of billions of dollars. So that's the need. China's BRI is evolving from being, as I, the way I see it, from a series of infrastructure projects to a, lot, a defined, defined geographic area. Previously, that's how it, it was conceived. Now it's a China-centered inter, inter, international infrastructure development framework of some type. So one of the manifestations of this is increased interest outside of the initial Belt and Road, Belt and Road region and involvement in financing of related projects and not exactly BRI specific, but also having this dispute settlement of its own here and there, very fragmented. So BRI's involvement in the continental free trade ag agreements progression seems almost inevitable. And indeed, it's uh, already happening. So with the exception of the newly announced uh, you know, uh, CICC in, in China and some very you know, minor developments, and I believe disputes are being resolved before existing institutions such as the HKIC 
and under existing rules and institutions. So that is what I see so far happening. In terms of China's involvement in the ISDS reform direction, and I was surprised to see back in, 19, in, in uh, July 2019, the submission that China made to Institutional Working Group 3 on ISDS reform. China has indicated its desire to maintain the existing system with possible appellate mechanism, including the creation of a permanent appellate body. So with great emphasis on the correction of error, China appears willing to support the continuation of the ISDS system. Uh, in a way, that's not surprising uh, because China is becoming increasingly a capital exporting nation and China never really had a bad experience with ISDS the way it's conceived, whether through ICSID or UNCITRAL, unlike India, uh, which had a, a, a very ser a serious uh, you know, uh, bad experience and uh, renounced to some of their bilateral investment treaties. So many of Chinese uh, third generation bilateral investment treaties provide for ISDS full fledged. There are no indications that this is changing. There is no particular effort to even amend the existing treaties. I haven't heard anything. And there is no effort to multilateralize uh, or regionalize uh, investment treaties in that context. I don't think that is happening. So finally, I'd like to say a few words about new cases that are emerging and how they are being uh, resolved. One such example is the very recently filed uh, claim against Ghana by Beijing Everywhere Traffic and Lighting Technology Limited. It's for $55 million, it's UNCITRAL, uh, and it's under the China-Ghana Bilateral Investment Treaty um, concluded back in the 1980s, I think it's 1989. Um, that particular treaty is interesting. I looked at it, uh, allows arbitration only for uh, determining the quantum of damages, but still the company has filed uh, its claim under that, uh, that uh, treaty. And of course, there is some reports that there is also another case against Nigeria under the Nigeria China bit 2001. And I'd like to uh, uh, read uh, what it says in, in pertinent provision. If a dispute cannot be settled within six months after resort to negotiations as specified in paragraph one of this article, it may be submitted at the request of either party to an ad hoc arbitral tribunal. The provisions of this paragraph shall not apply if the investor concerned has resorted to the procedure specified in paragraph two of this article. So it's just an example of a very traditional dispute settlement clause, and they're using that uh, to bring an action against, against Nigeria. So just to conclude, so the unprecedented acceleration of Chinese trade, investment, and commerce with Africa in the last three decades that at some point invited some level of curiosity of observers about what they might do differently in terms of dispute settlement. I was one of those who was very curious. And in fact, I wrote a book about it. So given each side's lack of, you know, very meaningful participation in the creation of these institutions, the existing ones. So the curiosity was about what would, what might they do? They have not done anything differently the way I see it. And the trends are in the direction of utilization of the existing rules in many of the existing institutions, while at the same time, building more China-centered institutions with modest rule changes and more or less um, keeping the underlying institutional and regular uh, rules-based uh, system. The one thing that is changing and I believe, I think that the change is probably going to occur at a very micro level of more robust participation of Chinese parties, Chinese council, Chinese arbitrators, and similarly, African council, African arbitrators and the like. So that is the direction that I see it moving. And one such example is in the new case that I just mentioned against China. This might be one of the first such cases. The council that the company retained is a Chinese law firm uh, and I uh, haven't seen the composition of the arbitral tribunal, but I won't be surprised if the composition is slightly different than the usual. And I think the direction to my opinion is 
uh, in my opinion, is the use of the existing rules and institutions, but at a very micro level, things are gonna be more diversified, are gonna be more, uh, you know, China and Africa focused. Uh, and that's, the, that's what uh, I wanted to say. And thank you very much. So I'll be happy to answer questions when they come. Thank you, Professor Kadane. So uh, uh, very well put and uh, good to see a little divergence, uh, respectful divergence uh, between you, Professor Wong. Great. So let's turn to uh, Dr. Dimsey. Uh, Dr. Mariel Dimsey is a uh, partner and co-head of CMS International Arbitration uh, here in Hong Kong. And she's an Australian lawyer, originally Hong Kong solicitor. Um, as we noted before, she has her doctorate, summa cum laude, from uh, Basel in investment arbitration. I should mention uh, Professor Kadani has his doctorate from Georgetown, also very distinguished. Um, and uh, Dr. Dimsey also uh, has done a degree in, in uh, University of Cologne and worked in the ICC Court of Arbitration and has a lot of experience. So the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Professor Alford. Just let me try and share my screen. There we go. Can we all see the presentation? Yes. Great. Okay, just let me get back to the right screen. Okay, so thank you very much, as I said, and good morning from Hong Kong and good evening to the United States and whoever else is listening in from that time zone. I love this um, new virtual world that we're all in where we can really do these global events. So I'm very happy to be a part of this. Thank you also to the organizers and to Yingsha for their kind invitation for me to participate in this event. Um, I'm having a slightly different approach today. I'm not an academic. I did dally in academia, as you can see from my doctor title very early on, um, but found my way into private practice and ended up working in Hong Kong. So I thought this might be a nice opportunity to weave in very nicely with what uh, Professor Kadani has just said um, from the perspective of someone who's operating in the region and has worked in BRI disputes, and I'm using that term very loosely, um, involving Chinese and um, external parties. So I, I hope you forgive me for my less academic approach to, to this topic, um, but I hope you will be um, interested in it nonetheless. So what I'm going to talk about today is very broadly, and there is a little bit of overlap with Pro Professor Kadani, but nothing too controversial, I promise you, is dispute resolution in the context of the BRI. Uh, as Professor Wang said at the outset, there have been numerous jurisdictions that have signed MOAs with the PRC on joining the BRI. Obviously, this is nothing new. These projects are largely in full swing, and there will, of course, be many more to come. But just simply through the sheer nature of the projects at the BRI, um, is generating, you know, they're, they're long-term, they're cross-border, they're international by nature, they're high value, high public interest, in many cases, highly political. So one of the core aspects that I think parties were looking at when they concluded these contracts um, at the start of the BRI initiative, and will certainly look at going forward, is that they have effective dispute resolution mechanisms in place. Now, at the risk of saying a little bit of what Professor Kadani said, I will skip over it very quickly. I'll discuss very briefly both the investment and the commercial arbitration aspects of um, BRI or in the context of BRI disputes at least, and then turn to finally what Hong Kong can offer as a hub for BRI disputes. <clears throat> uh, as Professor Kadani has also mentioned, obviously bilateral investment treaties, BITS and IIAs, international investment agreements, are a very relevant tool in the context of the BRI. Many BRI projects, for the reasons I just stated, are going to attract this kind of protection. They're high stakes, they're high, highly political. The, just the, the players that are involved are probably going to lead to the, the issues that come out of them and the, the, the parties involved um, being suitable for, for BIT or IIA resolution. Uh, PR, the PRC has 35 um, BITs with African countries. As Professor Kadani said, many of them provide for negotiation as a first step, and this is a typical feature of PRC bits, followed by investment arbitration. I won't go into ICSID in any great detail, but simply to say that ICSID is available if both state parties to the BIT are member states to the ICSID Convention. Uh, the interesting feature with ICSID, which makes it quite 
sidelined for my presentation is that it's a delocalized procedure in the sense that it doesn't have a juridical seat. So for the purposes of talking about hubs, this is probably less relevant, but I thought I should mention it nonetheless. Of course, in the context of other institutional investment arbitration, such as the ICC, the HKIAC, SCC, and there are many others, I'm, I'm not trying to be selective. And the um, advent of ad hoc international investment arbitration under the UNSI trial rules, for example, as Professor Kadani said, this will be of more relevance because obviously there you do have a juridical seat and you will be governed at least to some extent by the Lex Arbitri. Of course, what I'll focus on today for the purposes of my presentation or my discussion here is the, invest the international commercial arbitration context in the BRI. Um, similarly to the investment arbitration, and in fact, these two will weave into one another. There will be two layers of many BRI disputes. You'll have the state level um, disputes, the high state political issues that will probably, is my screen sharing paused or is someone, I'm not sure what I've done. Okay, if you can all still see me, I'll keep going. I'm getting a message that my screen sharing is paused, but anyway. Um, so basically what you will look at is the two layers. You'll have the high stakes investment arbitration disputes going on. And of course, at the more micro level, you have the project contracts, which in many cases, um, as borne out by the experience thus far, provide for just normal, as I'll put it, international commercial arbitration. And okay, obviously- Dimsy, I think your uh, slides is, is frozen. We're still seeing the first slide. Okay, why is it pause? Is that better? Yes, it's, it's working now. Okay, sorry about that. I will keep going and hopefully that won't stop again. Okay, so I'm talking about international commercial arbitration. Um, just very briefly, um, this is probably more known to many of you than it is to me. Um, arbitration, of course, is preferable for these types of disputes for many reasons. I've listed out a few here. I think particularly in the context of BRI, one I'd like to highlight is obviously the avoidance of local courts. Um, many players in the BRI scene will have a probably an inherent distrust of other legal systems for resolving these kinds of high stakes disputes. So arbitration is a happy medium in that context. And also of course, the enforcement mechanisms under the New York Convention. Um, from memory, the New York Convention currently has 160 member states of which I think about 120 are BRI jurisdictions. Um, so under, that, under this, this instrument, of course, you will have reciprocal enforcement and recognition procedures and also very limited grounds for setting aside awards or refusing to enforce them. Okay, the slide moved, I hope, there we go. Just very briefly on Hong Kong suitability as an arbitration hub. Now, as someone who lives and practices in Hong Kong, I really do see Hong Kong as, as a gateway to China, uh, particularly for, for global disputes. And this is actually borne out by what I see in practice. One of our core um, areas of work, if you like, is dealing with disputes either for Chinese parties or against Chinese parties with an international nexus. So often we're representing, let's say European um, claimants against Chinese respondents, or we may be representing Chinese claimants against US respondents. So I think from, from Hong Kong as its, as its location indicates, this is probably um, one of its main selling points, which also extends to the, the BRI context. Of course, um, as, as Professor Alfred alluded to in the introductory remarks, um, there are some challenges with, with Hong Kong as a hub, which we'll talk about in the discussion. But just very briefly, um, Hong Kong has a neutral arbitration friendly law, the arbitration ordinance. It's based on the model law. It's updated regularly. Uh, on top of that, they have a specialist judiciary uh, judicial list that deals with arbitration related court proceedings. So you have that specialist expertise, even at the court level, for any um, proceedings that may arise in aid of arbitration or, or in, in relation to arbitration. And we particularly have a number of modern institutions here in Hong Kong that really are behind the whole BRI initiative and see this quite frankly as a huge opportunity. And I'll talk about them very briefly next. And finally, um, through China, it was previously through the UK, but now through China, Hong Kong is also a party to the New York Convention. So all of the benefits I mentioned about the New York Convention also apply here. 
Uh, just very quickly, um, as a BRI specific slide, um, I've mentioned the geographical location and the um, attractions for both sides of the transaction. There is also a simplified arrangement for the enforcement of arbitral awards between Hong Kong and the PRC, um, which is very, very closely tracked to the New York Convention grounds. Um, and in particular, and this is a new development, which I personally think is a game changer for Hong Kong as a seat. Uh, there's an arrangement concerning mutual assistance in court ordered interim measures between Hong Kong and the PRC. It's only been enforced since October, 2019, but it basically allows parties to Hong Kong seated arbitrations that are being administered by a certain list of approved institutions to seek interim relief. So to preserve assets, um, to, to preserve conduct in some cases from mainland Chinese courts with respect to parties in mainland China. Now, Hong Kong is the only jurisdiction outside China that provides this kind of arrangement. And this, the, the statistics that are coming out of the arrangement being used are quite impressive. So I really think this is one of the USPs that Hong Kong will be able to rely on going forward. Very quickly on the institutions, um, the HKIAC is the local institution, um, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. Obviously it has a BRI working group. It has extensive experience involving PRC parties. It's a very internationally minded institution, but at the same time has the linguistic and the subject matter capabilities to deal with disputes involving China. Um, it, they had 99, 95, sorry, um, HKIAC administered arbitrations um, between the PRC and other BRI jurisdictions between 2016 and 2020, um, with a total amount of dispute of 1.8 billion US dollars. They currently are also administering a, several cases involving BRI projects. Obviously, I don't know the details, but they also told me that they involve African parties as well. And with this new interim measures arrangement, um, they've processed 13 applications involving four BRI jurisdictions since it came into effect. Very quickly on the ICC, which is certainly um, very international, but also has a dedicated Hong Kong office. Uh, the ICC um, at its international level has a Belt and Road Commission specifically aimed at honing procedures in addressing these kind of disputes. They also have impressive statistics about BRI jurisdictions. You can see them there on the slide. So this is another institution that's really at the forefront in Hong Kong. Finally, last but not least, uh, let me turn to SeaTac. Now, CTAC is an interesting case because it's the China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission. It's generally very China focused, but it also has a dedicated Hong Kong arbitration center. And interestingly, in 2017, as a reaction to the BRI and the increasing need for investment protection and investment arbitration rules, they introduced the CTAC arbit investment arbitration rules, which actually name Hong Kong as the place of arbitration in their default rules. So that's a very interesting, promising development from them as well. Unsurprisingly, they have a very large number of BRI disputes as well. Some of those are administ administered out of the Hong Kong Center. Many, of course, are administered out of the SEAC commissions on the mainland. Um, and they also have a number of BRI thought leadership initiatives uh, such as recently they completed research on the commercial arbitration systems in, I think it was 25 BRI jurisdictions. So they're really making an effort to map out what different countries do in the international commercial arbitration space and how they can essentially springboard off that and make their dispute resolution procedures better. So that's my very quick run, run through um, Hong Kong as a hub for BRI and general points associated with that. I'm very happy to answer questions um, once the round is opened up and, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Dimsey. Thank you. You also packed a lot in. And our fourth uh, and final speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Gu Weixia. Uh, and Dr. Gu is uh, Associate Professor at the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law, which is where she earned her LLM and SJD and she also has won all kinds of awards uh, herself over the year, including being Hong Kong U's Outstanding Young Researcher. Um, she's still very young. Um, outstanding Teaching Award as well. Uh, Faculty of Law's Research Output Award. Three times in addition, she's won the top prize from the China Society of Private International Law for her scholarship. She's been cited by courts all over the world, the Chinese Supreme People's Court, the US Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, the Texas Supreme Court, and to, I imagine to be cited in a Texas court 
if you're not an American, is quite unusual. Uh, and she uh, has been a Fulbright Scholar at NYU. So we turn the floor over to you, uh, Professor Gu, and I would note that she also has uh, recently published a book in this area called Dispute Resolution China, Litigation, Arbitration, Mediation, and Their Interactions. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Alfred. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Ng and uh, the organizers of the conference to having me here. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to join this distinguished panel. Um, it's not easy to be the last speaker, and I hope that I will reflect upon um, the previous speakers and then try to um, build upon what has not been covered in their presentations. So um, everyone can sh uh, see my screen, uh, the slides. All right, that's good. So uh, what I plan to um, offer in the next 10 to 15 minutes, it's about um, to provide an, a, a, a sort of like the dynamics about the competition of the BI uh, international dispute resolution. Um, I have provided a map, uh, which I know is not very perfect, but just to outline uh, for you and for those who are not very familiar uh, about um, the BII roadmap. So BII starts from China. So here it's China and then going westward. Um, so there is a land-based belt called Silk Road Economic Belt uh, through the Euro-Asian Land Bridge. And you also have the sea base, uh, Maritime Silk Road um, going downward through the South China Sea and the, um, the China, India, uh, Pacific Ocean throughout uh, to the Africa and the European uh, continent. Now, um, you have many different approaches um, to see the dispute resolution dynamic uh, in the BRI. So what I'm arguing is trying to approach um, the issues from different background of the BRI investors. So uh, generally speaking, I've divided in them into three different categories. So they can be divided into state-to-state -state disputes, state-investor disputes, and investor-investor disputes. So that have been outlined by Professor Hung Wah, uh, Professor Kadani, and then Dr. Dempsey in their presentations as well. Uh, in terms of state-state, you will see that so far, uh, there's no specific um, mechanism for resolving state-to-state -state, um, dispute resolution. Um, the existing mechanisms in the world that we can make reference to are the WTO DSB board. And the general rule is to seek to suspend the concessions or obligations under the existing agreement of the WTO. And then if you can't resolve the issues and then there is an arbitration by the WTO panel or an arbitrator appointed by the direct general of the WTO. You also have the bid system under the bilateral investment treaties where you can follow an amicable agreement uh, through the diplomatic channels. Now, um, in terms of the state investor disputes, uh, as, uh, has, uh, as have been outlined by Professor Kedanit's uh, uh, speech, very recently we have seen two um, investment treaty arbitration uh, with, between the Chinese companies and the African sovereign states. So the first one is in February 2021, just this month, you have uh, a Beijing-based Chinese construction company brought a claim against Ghana uh, under the China-Ghana Investment Treaty uh, under the unsitural ad hoc arbitration procedure. And then uh, it has been reported through the Global Arbitration Review that another ISDS claim has been brought up by the Chinese company uh, underway against Nigeria. So both are state investor disputes and I have been keeping close eyes on the two disputes and then I'm aware that uh, the China African arbitrators and councils have been featured uh, in both disputes. Uh, the alternative way to um, resolve the ISDS disputes is to submit to exit under the World Bank. Now, there is the question here. Uh, is it the time for the Chinese homegrown state investor dispute resolution institution to be put into place? Now, there are a lot of interesting developments in this regard. Firstly, um, whether that can be resolved under CICC, the China International uh, Commercial Court, which has been in place in June 2018. You know that according to the CICC provisions, uh, the jurisdiction of the CICC is to cover commercial disputes with the exclusion of the investment treaty disputes. So uh, there is um, a high demand for the SPC to issue sub, uh, supplementary judicial uh, clarifications to see whether the CICC can expand jurisdiction to cover um, state investment uh, dispute claims. Now the CTAC, BAC and SCA, I mean, uh, the Beijing Arbitration Commission 
and the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration, the leading Chinese arbitration institutions, they have also promulgated um, specific investment treaty arbitration rules in 2017, uh, from 2017 uh, to 2019. Now, the third type is about investor-investor disputes. And in terms of, you know, those kind of like private international law, uh, when I'm telling about state, state, state investor, they are more related to international economic law. So when you go down to the private international disputes, so there are three major methods or three major means available to the disputants, namely litigation, arbitration, and mediation in the international context. In terms of litigation, you can bring the disputes into two different venues or fora. Um, uh, you can bring the disputes between local courts. You can also bring the disputes between international commercial courts, which is a very new species uh, in the international dispute resolution setting in the past several years. Now, uh, in terms of bringing out litigation before local courts, um, just as Professor, uh, just as Dr. Dinsey has outlined, Hong Kong is very attractive um, to the BI disputes. Very recently, um, about two years ago, um, 2019 February, and then now you are uh, having this judgment finalized. Uh, the Hong Kong High Court has the very first and very high profile BI dispute um, called DP Wo. So in China Merchants Port, um, uh, in terms of a Djibouti um, case um, uh, before the High Court of the Hong Kong seeking damage its interests and a declaration that the China merchants uh, induced the Djibouti government to breach concession agreements, uh, which gave DP World exclusive control over all ports in the Djibouti. So that's about the local courts. So far, we haven't seen any BI specific dispute brought before the mainland Chinese courts, uh, uh, as far as I know. When in terms of international commercial courts, the main rivalries in the BI context are the CICC and the SICC. Now, I will say more about the CICC, and then if the time allows, I will say something about the SICC in Singapore as well. CICC, uh, that's a very new species in both China as well as in the entire world. CICC, the China International Commercial Court, was newly established in June 2018 by the Supreme People's Court. So this is a subsidiary of the SPC in Beijing. And the judgments delivered by the CICC is deemed as the judgment being delivered by the Supreme People's Court in Beijing. Now let's take a look about the innovations of the CICC. Well, I have outlined the innovations for you in the uh, PowerPoint slides. Uh, the first innovation is that they have an international commercial expert committee called the ICEC, very different from the Singapore International Commercial Court or the Dubai uh, IFC. Uh, the CICC doesn't have foreign judges um, because of the PRC judges law that all Chinese judges need to be of Chinese nationality. So what do they do is they compile an expert, um, a, a, a panel of expertise of ICEC. So far, there are 20 Chinese, mainland Chinese, and 35 foreign legal professionals, including those from Hong Kong and Taiwan. So far, there is no Macaonese. Uh, but there are uh, those from Hong Kong, like Anthony Niu, uh, like Rimsky Yun, our former um, uh, Secretary for Justice. Uh, there is one from Taiwan as well, uh, um, uh, Professor, uh, uh, the Secretary General of the, um, the Chinese Arbitration Association in Taipei. So now to get, altogether, there are 55 both Chinese as well as foreign legal professionals who are sitting on the ICEC. What can they do? They can mediate. Um, and the mediation result is called mediation settlement agreements of the ICEC. Uh, they have the beauty to be converted into the CICC judgments, i.e. Uh, those foreign legal expertise, they can be combined and they can be what Kai Chorus the falsified into a CICC judgment. Very interesting, as I have observed, is that, you know, those foreign legal professionals, they largely drawn from international arbitration background. Very few are from mediation background, and then maybe 99% are from, you know, international arbitration background. Uh, the second most outstanding innovation is the one-stop multi-tier dispute resolution platform, uh, which has been mentioned by Professor Hung Wang in his um, presentation as well. What do they do? Is that the CICC is linking with five Chinese leading arbitration institutions, including CTAC, BAC, Shenzhen, Shanghai, and CMAC and two leading Chinese international commercial mediation institutions, uh, namely CI, uh, CCPIT Mediation Center 
and the Shanghai Commercial Mediation Centers, and but with mediation and arbitration to be conducted separately by different institutions rather than under the CICC one roof. Now, what do I see? Uh, very recently, Professor Matthew Airy has also organized a workshop, an international um, symposium on China international legal ordering. Uh, my arguments uh, from the perspective of the CICC is that CICC represents China's top-down capacity building effort uh, in the dispute resolution infrastructure and the Chinese government's ambition to create BRI uh, Lex Mercatoria. Very different from its original BRI approach, which is very soft law driven, uh, uh, relying very much upon memorandum of understanding or memorandum of agreements, you will see that CICC has now shown a shift in the soft law driven international legal ordering approach in the Beijing consensus. I will skip SICC uh, and, uh, and the time constraints and I will just go uh, ahead. Now I'll just show this is a picture of the CICC. Um, the left hand picture is the first CICC uh, established in Shenzhen and the right hand picture of the first batch uh, of the ICEC committee composed of both Chinese and foreign nationals. In the second batch of the uh, ICEC committee members, you also, also see three um, African experts. Now, in addition to litigation, arbitration has played a dominance role. Uh, you have seen hundreds, thousands of um, international arbitration cases arising in the context of the BI. Well, arbitration is due playing a dominant role pretty much due to the wide applicability of the New York Convention which is the global passport of the arbitral awards. The pros of the international arbitration is they have enjoyed global enforceability, they have flexible procedures, they have confidentiality and expeditions. Well, also you have the cons is that you have rising costs and increasing judicialization of the arbitration procedures, especially when you're involving um, sort of, you know, common law driven councils and arbitrators and then tends to be very judicialized. And then the international operation is also meeting increasing challenges uh, by the rising popularity of the international commercial courts, uh, such as Singapore. Mediation. Uh, this is a very new player, a very new stakeholder uh, in the international dispute resolution sector as well. Uh, particularly, um, this is a very new international law called Singapore Mediation Convention, um, promulgated in 2018 and open for membership in 2019. That's to provide a global passport for in the, uh, international mediation settlement agreements so that it will be providing a parallel to the New York Convention on the cross-border uh, mediation settlement agreements. So far, there are 53 member states signing the Singapore Mediation Convention, including PRC, but only six has entered into the force um, having uh, completed their ratification procedures. So you will see that China has not completed ratification procedures. So uh, Singapore Mediation Convention cannot take an effect uh, to China, to PRC. But we do see there is a high efficiency in the growth of the international membership uh, in the SMC. Well, compared to international arbitration, my personal view is that mediation is more culturally laden, but less legalistic, where arbitration is more legalistic. And, and in terms of membership, uh, in the New York Convention, you have 166, which covers almost the entire world, versus six of the Singapore Mediation Convention, which has just taken effect. Now, in the next two slides, also my last two slides, I'm just trying to provide you with my conclusion. First, for the BI International Dispute Resolution within China, and second, for the BI International Dispute Resolution outside China. First, I will offer my humble views about the international DR within China in terms of the BI context. When you look at the, um, the, 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 the comprehensive view of litigation, arbitration, and mediation in the past 20 years, especially in the past 10 years when the BI has been in the rising importance role in China, you will find that among the three primary methods of international dispute resolution, commercial arbitration has been very unique. It has today uniquely transcends the traditional or conventional social political constraints. Very interestingly, the PRC arbitration law has been promulgated in 1994, taking in fact in 1995. So in the past 25 years, the PRC arbitration law has never been comprehensively or robustly amended. Well, having said that, you will see that the state 
had sort of, you know, indirectly delegate the reform of the arbitration to the market. So the arbitration reform in China or the development of the arbitration in China in the past 20 or 10 years has been largely shaped by China's interna internationalization needs um, and then China's market um, uh, oriented considerations, especially arbitration has played a major role in serving China's BI interests, especially um, in the soft law expansion. Well, what I see um, in my article in the American Journal of Comparative Law, as well as my monograph uh, with Rutledge this month, is that you will see that in the past five years, China's arbitration market has been formed and has grown some leading arbitration institutions such as you know, Beijing and Shenzhen, in addition to CTAC, with the full capacity and full cap capability to compete in the BRI market. Now, I will turn to the BRI International Dispute Resolution outside China. So if you look beyond China, I'm more familiar with BRI Asia, and I'm very happy to share with you my research efforts about BRI Asia in the past uh, five years. So you will see that in BRI Asia, uh, in terms of you know, BRI Asia roadmap, the arbitration market has also been formed along the BRI Asia roadmap. And the major role players in a lot of the BRI Asia are Singapore, Malaysia, China, Hong Kong, and Korea, with their leading institutions like SIAC, ACICA, HKIC, CTEC, Beijing, Shenzhen, and KCAB, uh, grabbing the BI dispute resolution market quite aggressively. Will that be the trend of BI Africa? I'm playing a quite positive role in the sense, and then I think BI Africa will also uh, gradually form um, a dispute resolution market. Now, in BI Asia, another very um, outstanding phenomenon is that you will see that litigation, arbitration, mediation, they have functioned all together to form a multi-tier dispute resolution interconnected network with great diversity and flexibility. There are two very outstanding examples in this context. One is China, the other is Singapore. China has formed a very top-down force in forming the one-stop multi-tier dispute resolution platform uh, making of, uh, to be composed of CICC, CTEC, BAC, Shenzhen, and then CCPIT, XCMC, um, sort of, you know, um, interconnected platform. Singapore, on the other hand, has formed the top-down SICC, Singapore International Commercial Court, SIAC, Singapore International Arbitration Center, and SIMC, Singapore International Mediation Center, agglomeration trio, what I call, uh, this is an agglomeration trinity uh, of one-stop dispute resolution uh, um, services. Will this multi-tier dispute resolution be the trend in the BI Africa? Ohada is now consulting us um, and making reference to our book. This is also a forthcoming book which will come out in October 2021. Uh, this is a CUP edited book um, co-edited by me and Justice and Selma Reyes of the Singapore International Commercial Court. Um, so with that, I would like to conclude my um, presentation and I look forward um, to your comments and suggestions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gould. So uh, terrific panel and uh, some variety of viewpoint. So let me start with uh, an observation or two and then some questions of my own, but I wanna leave time for questions from the audience. Um, so first, I, it, it seemed Professor Kidane was uh, suggesting that um, uh, notwithstanding the growth of Chinese investment in Africa, there really has not been a major set of institutional changes. Professor Wong was suggesting that the approach that uh, uh, China has taken uh, uh, substantively seems to be pushing toward a need for uh, new and different kinds of institutions, although uh, perhaps some of the approach is being so project or, or short-term focused isn't necessarily uh, conducive to building new and different institutions. Uh, Dr. Dimsey seemed to be suggesting in Hong Kong, uh, what by and large seem uh, high-end traditional institutions are being uh, refined and developed well. And uh, Dr. Gu, Professor Gu, uh, at the end suggests both in terms of institutions like the CICC and uh, uh, substantive method like MedArb, uh, uh, we see some innovation. So I wonder, 
first of all, could I ask you to comment on each other? So, Professor Kidani, um, and this is not to avoid my uh, offering more comments or questions, but Professor Kidani, uh, as you listened to Professor Gu, did it seem to you um, that maybe we're still in the early stages with the CICC, for example, being a 2018 innovation, but we're beginning to see more of the seeds from the Chinese side of, um, you know, what may be you know, at least variants, new kinds of, not radically new institutions, I'm sure you're quite right about that, but at least within the category, a different flavor, a different texture. I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Yes, uh, thanks, Professor Alfred. Yeah, absolutely. I see, uh, I think that's a very good way of putting it. I mean, the seeds are now being uh, seen. Um, it all depends on what, with, with what level of zeal that uh, it would be pursued. And I see uh, structural challenges. Um, when I say that, as Professor Gu properly described, its, its decisions are going to be considered as if they were decisions of the uh, Supreme People's Court. So the, the, there, is, there is a fundamental reason why arbitration thrived while court judgments remained localized. And that is because of the absence of an enforcement legal mechanism. And China has, I know in recent years, signed judicial assistance treaties, uh, enforcement of court judgment treaties. Those are not too many. Uh, the United States, for instance, doesn't even have one. I, I don't believe there is many. Uh, and at the time when they were deliberating about creating the arbitral infrastructure, including the New York Convention, the Exit Convention, there was a reason why they actually completely avoided that, that possibility. So that is not forthcoming. It doesn't look like it. So there is that enforceability issue of those judgments outside of China. But obviously within China, it's an innovative one. And of course, the Singapore one is also, we're watching it very carefully. But obviously, yes, those were the kinds of things that I had actually expected 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and now they are emerging and in what direction they will evolve, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Thank, thank you, thank you. So Professor Wong, I wondered to ask you, um, I thought your observations uh, were very astute about um, uh, sort of selective reshaping, but perhaps the content of some of the agreements not being conducive to building uh, uh, new institutions because they're too short-term oriented. What else would you advise as somebody who uh, is so uh, astute at understanding uh, the different actors? What what ought China or Chinese companies for Chinese actors or the Chinese government to be doing to further build institutions, you, to get a, a, away from what a little bit of what you described as sort of a, a short, maybe a little bit too much of a short-term focus, a short-term orientation that isn't quite as conducive to rule in institution building. What else is called for? Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Effort. Uh, I think it's actually, it's been pretty important that uh, to see that uh, the broad picture where China's uh, MOUs or primary agreements, they work with the secondary agreements or project agreements. And I think the, I think right as mentioned, they have a short-term focus in terms of projects or uh, contracts, but also long-term the MOUs may, may also serve for the term of developing of the institution and practices uh, incrementally. Um, I think that they uh, like to make some structural changes uh, in dispute settlement. In terms of what they they can do, I mean, in, in terms of the potential uh, challenges, I think maybe one thing is about transparency. I mean, to increase the transparency, um, I think that's been very important for, you know, for the governance perspective. Uh, is at the high level, uh, you know, uh, MOU, but also at the project level, and also I think it's been also due process, you know, in, in the dispute settlements uh, to ensure that the interest of the parties will be uh, will be protected and also respected. I think also the the big way to have more internationalization, uh, including potential, uh, you know, 
uh, judges from diff, you know, different aspects because that'll be very important to ensure the uh, quality of their work and uh, to build more confidence in that regard. Um, so I will see that actually it's remain to be seen how they play out because uh, mediation, for example, is quite different from one country to another. Uh, if even you compare China with Singapore, that'd be quite different. Uh, they will have a profound implication in practice. So if you look at mediation, uh, and also combined with arbitration and litigation. So I think more efforts need to be done and also uh, there need to be uh, uh, very careful efforts uh, from different stakeholders. Thank All right. you. So very, very thoughtful. Of course, sometimes it may be that both the host government and the foreign party may both have interest in not being perhaps quite as transparent as they might. So uh, I know that uh, uh, Dr. Xiaoying has done some very impressive work about the standard gauge railway in Kenya, where I think it's fair to say neither the Chinese um, a bridge and road company was uh, heavily involved with that, nor the Kenyan government were keen to have all the terms um, uh, be transparent. So, so I totally share your view, Professor Wong, about the importance of transparency of due process of a more uh, international set of dis of uh, dispute uh, resolution parties, but but it may be that it's hard to achieve, even though it's uh, very very worthwhile. Of course, when it emerged in that case, where the dispute resolution was to take place, that itself uh, was quite a, caused quite a political stir. Uh, let me ask Dr. Dimsey a question. So. Uh, uh, very impressive uh, undertakings, of course, in Hong Kong. Um, but uh, as you look across the border at the um, developments that Professor Gus described, the CICC, uh, this <clears throat> internationally renowned 35 uh, experts drawn to uh, be available, um, uh, innovative efforts, at, at other methods of resolving disputes. Um, what about the Hong Kong mainland competition <laughs> for the, uh, hosting uh, dispute resolution? It's obviously, it's a very important and lucrative business. How do you see that? Or how does one turn it to be a mutually beneficial collaborative undertaking? I think, I think that's the million dollar question, Professor Alford. I mean, I, I listened with keen interest with, with what, to what Professor Gu was saying, because that is at the moment I, what I see, and I've been speaking to my colleagues here on, on, in the Hong Kong market, so to speak. It's one of the challenges that I think Hong Kong will face in the coming years, because yes, when the BRI was announced and everything was being pushed, and there were some very noteworthy announcements from both the PRC and the Hong Kong governments about Hong Kong becoming this hub for dispute resolution. You see the evolution over the last five years and in particular, for example, with the outline of the Guangdong Hong Kong Macau Greater Development Plan in 2019, where they've said on the one hand in sort of one chapter that they're still promoting Hong Kong as a service center for BRI disputes and then a couple of chapters on, don't, don't quote me on this, but in different parts of the plan, they're talking about also promoting arbitration centers in Guangdong um, and that Hong Kong should also support those initiatives. I think that um, you need to see it in a very nuanced way um, in order to, to avoid any sort of contradiction because I do think that the Hong Kong market will remain a unique market, particularly for foreign entrants who have perhaps in their contractual negotiation phase relatively equal bargaining power. Of course, as Professor Gu pointed out, if the CICCs take that very small step, in my opinion, to open up their jurisdictional scope, it's going to be a very hard sell to say why Hong Kong would be better than perhaps the Shenzhen CICC with their regional experts. I think one of the points will be the nationality of the um, decision makers. Of course, in arbitration, you still maintain that very important um, right to appoint your own arbitrator in 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 non in, in in sorry ad, in institutional ad hoc arbitration. I think that um, that will be one of the key selling points that may distinguish it. But it's going to be it's going to be an interesting, not not, not struggle struggles too strong a word. But I think there will be some healthy competition in the region and. 
um, from my perspective, it's it's anyone's guess at the moment how it will play out, but I'm sure that there will be interesting developments in the next couple of years. Thank you, very, very thoughtful. Professor Gu, could I throw the same question at you um, from the PRC vantage point, the mainland vantage point? Um, um, how are you looking at, um, even with all the sophisticated developments you've just described, uh, um, the expertise across the border in Hong Kong. Right. Um, thank you very much, Professor Alfred. I always learn a lot from you, whether in um, Matthew Airy's conference or, or this conference organized by Ying. Um, I think Hong Kong too has a very distinctive role to play in terms of the common law um, advantage, English advantage, uh, which is not very universally available under the CICC. Well, the parties they can still choose, but you know, um, there has do need to be go through a screening process uh, by the CICC advisory panel, and then uh, in terms of the choice, uh, I mean, the freedom of choice, um, it would not be without limitations so far. Uh, if you look at the four cases so far that have been heard by the CICC, mostly are related to arbitration. Three out of the four cases are related to the judicial review of um, arbitration uh, from Shenzhen. So you see that CICC so far from the market perspective is not really freely chosen by the parties themselves. So it's not really a hot pick by the dispute resolutions, uh, lawyers themselves or the parties themselves. It's largely about the feeding of the cases mm -hmm. by the SPC so far. And then by arranging the feeding of the cases of the SPC, uh, they will guarantee the stability of the caseload uh, of the CICC in the initial years. That's pretty much, you know, the reference we gain from the SICC, which is a part, uh, a subsidiary of the, the High Court uh, of the Singapore, there you can also feed a case. Going back to Professor Alfred's point about the, um, the vantage point of China, well, China is huge. Uh, nobody could imagine that China has 255 arbitration institutions. Even that the sheer size of China are very similar to that of the United States. United States has no more than 10 arbitration institutions, whether regional or national, thinking about AAA or, or you know, um, uh, those more and more um, CEDA, I mean, those more uh, prominent or those less prominent regional um, state level. But China has 255. So quite a number of the names you have never heard about. <laughs> Even me, I have never heard about in some hinterland provinces. So this huge number of the arbitration institutions has naturally gave rise to the institutional arbitration market in China in the past five to 10 years. So for those who can survive and who can play very well uh, in the picture like Shenzhen, like Beijing, uh, as I have argued, they really have the full capacity and capability um, to represent China to compete in the world, but it's not really applicable to entire China. So I'm only outlining a very limited number of cases like Shenzhen, uh, Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration, which has the full support backed up by the Shenzhen government. You have never seen an arbitration institution which has occupied the, um, the entire floor, the 41 floor, 41st floor uh, of the Shenzhen Stock Exchange building, um, and that it's free of charge. <laughs> So I, I think that's a full backup by the Shenzhen municipal government. And that if you look at the Beijing Arbitration Com uh, Commission, they have occupied two floors of the China Merchants Tower um, in very CBD places of Beijing, and it's their property. They purchased the property. So you see that, you know, um, there's only a very limited number, just Beijing and Shenzhen, uh, who have, who have, you know, come out ahead, um, which can compete in the same level with Hong Kong and Singapore. But not all about China, about the 200 plus. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask, I see Xiaoying has her hand up, but let me ask one last question. And uh, and that is, um, Professor Gu intimated toward the end of her talk about going out toward Africa. And I wonder, uh, maybe I start with Professor Kandani, but if anybody else wants to comment, they can. Uh, I would think as um, impressive as these institutions are in Hong Kong and China, it must be daunting, though, for some African parties. Uh, think of expensive, uh, far away, um, not necessarily familiar. Um, you you were mentioning uh, using existing institutions and maybe the seeds of these new ones, but 
do we see uh, prospects or hopes for something located on the continent itself uh, that would be another alternative? I wonder, Professor Kadani, if you'd comment on that and any of the other panelists who, who wish to. Um, yes, I think there, there's been some level of effort to locate some institutions, China, Africa, dispute settlement institutions on the continent. Um, the one that is slightly more advanced is the one in South Africa and in association with the South African Arbitration Center there. And I think it's uh, another one in the Ohada region. And there hasn't been a very robust kind of effort to, to make sure that these institutions have been strengthened. So in my, I think what I, what I know and what I hear is the majority actually of China, Africa type disputes are still being resolved at, at the ICC in Paris and, and in mm -hmm. London and some uh, in Xinjiang and also in Beijing. But other than that, I think the effort has been started uh, many years ago and they will probably strengthen them. Uh, but th that actually has happened. And the one in South Africa is the most prominent. Thank you. Uh, maybe take a short answer, uh, Professor Gu or uh, Dr. Dimsey raised your hand and then we'll get to Shai Ying. And I don't want to forget Professor uh, Ramaj has a question in the chat box. So, yeah, I just, uh, yes. Yes, Professor Alfred. Um, well, actually, there is a Beijing Arbitration Commission and Nairobi Arbitration Center. So we see that the Chinese, the leading Chinese arbitration centers, they're very acute. Uh, they are very mindful of grabbing the market. So they have established multiple um, subsidiaries. And then one of the most significant examples is the Beijing Arbitration Commission. Uh, the Beijing one, they have set up a collaboration office with the Nairobi Arbitration Center. Uh, and the other one is the Shenzhen has partnership with Singapore and South Africa. Uh, they are still under negotiation process, but I know that it will be taking shape very soon. And then the last one is CTEC. They are also um, very aggressive on the African market, and then they are under discussion with different partners as well. But for the one which has already been in existence is the Beijing Nairobi one, which has already, um, if my memory serves well, they have already some cases. Thank you. Thank you. Just a very brief comment from me. Um, just following on from what Professor Gu said, I think the institutions are very reactive to where their cases are coming from. And while I don't have as much experience with the Chinese, the mainland Chinese institutions, the HKIC and the ICC do react to where the cases come from and will set up offices there. You've seen that with the ICC, for example, in Brazil recently. Um, the HKIC has signed a memorandum with, Ru with a Russian institution. So these kind of things I think will come, but as Professor Gu said, there's, there's limited at the moment. Um, and my second comment would be that I think also, I, I fully appreciate the point, Professor Alfred, that um, China and Hong Kong are a long way away and it could be quite daunting for an African party to agree. But I, I'm of the firm view that the virtual world we're in right, right now will keep many of these elements even once COVID is, is finally over. And I do think that might also be another factor that will make it easier for a party that's geographically a long way away to agree to an arbitration institution uh, simply because you can put procedural measures in place to ensure that there's a virtual element to it so that issues like cost and lack of familiarity and visas and all those things that we used to worry about become less of a concern. Right, right. thank you, Dr. Dinsey. Uh, turn to uh, uh, Dr. Shaying, uh, you have a question. Thank you um, for all the very informative and interesting presentations and discussion. I learned a lot this morning. I have two questions for uh, Professor Kidani and Professor Wan, respectively, but um, um, but for the other two speakers, uh, please, uh, you, you're most more than welcome to, to jump in if you also want to share your thoughts on these questions. The first question uh, on the BITs China has signed with African countries. I wonder, um, in your research, have you seen in terms of the trend and status quo of China, Africa, BITs, have you seen any difference between those China Africa BRTs and the BITs that China has signed with other countries, especially with developed countries um, in the past. And the second question is that in, uh, in, in Professor Wang's presentation, you mentioned that one of the main 
uh, sort of unique features uh, and also strength of the China's uh, BRI is the maximized flexibility in terms of the soft law instruments that it has developed along the way. But on the other hand, as several other speakers have mentioned, that there is also an ongoing trend of hardening the soft law instrument through, for example, the institutionalization of this Chinese built uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. So I wonder in the future, how do you see these two trends uh, play out and how do they interact with each other? Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Shangying. I uh, have done some research on Chinese uh, bilateral investment treaties with African states and also tried to compare them with uh, Chinese treaties with uh, you know European countries and others, including the China-Canada uh, investment treaties. What I found was uh, slightly surprising to me. I think this is this is published in uh, in an international law journal, uh, Cornell, many years ago. And in fact, there was another one that I, I wrote with Professor Widong Ju. So what we found was that um, so China, as people talk about, you know, many different generations of uh, bits. But uh, the ones that China signed, for instance, the most recent one is with, uh, with Canada. That was actually a Canadian model. Uh, it's not a Chinese model. So it seemed as if, and, and we looked at the various, uh, uh, you know, treaties with, with other Africa, uh, European countries, it tends to be, it's the European version that actually China signed on to, because obviously in the old days, China was a recipient of uh, capital. And uh, those, those treaties tend to be north-south. Those were the ones that uh, China signed. Even the recently, the most surprising one was the one with Canada. So Chinese model itself actually was signed many of those models with the African states. And, and also again, surprisingly, uh, China was willing to sign uh, the UK model that some African states have actually adopted. So, the, 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 the finding from this research was the Chinese uh, bilateral investment treaty program was not um, a, a model-based and centrally driven project as like in Canada or in the United States, fragmented and incremental and that uh, there, is, there is no consistent pattern that you can discern from the, looking at those. And that has been our finding. And I'm sure, you know, as, as time passes and if these, guys, if these treaties get uh, re renegotiated, there might emerge a different kind of trend. But otherwise, uh, these are instruments that stayed in, the, in, you know, from China's old times. So uh, that's what I can say. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Xiao. I think it's been uh, great questions. Uh, first, I would see that uh, maximize the flexibility is what I argue. Uh, not necessarily an advantage, I would call it um, a kind of characteristics mm -hmm. of China's uh, approach to BRI. I would see that they have a, both sides, two sides of the coin. On one side, people may argue that if properly managed, they may help to try and error. But another side, they have uh, you know, challenges, uh, predictability, consistency, and also coherence. So, uh, uh, so it's uh, it's streaming to be seen what effect will be, but of course I think it's been, too, you know, uh, you know it won't be a, a just one uh, kind of story. And second, I think I like your question. I found it's really useful to elaborate that. Thank you for that. About say linkage with say uh, maximize flexibility with the dispute settlement. I think that's actually I would understand the China's developments like CACC by spoken by many excellent uh, panelists here uh, that about an other practice. It's a kind of reflection on maximized flexibility. Uh, for one thing, uh, it's what I call a selective proactiveness. So China pro prioritizes selective aspects, which is fits China's preferences. Dispute settlements definitely one of that, and investment and trade facilitation others, because China sees the needs for doing that as one to the dispute settlements, which is familiar by China, that'll be good for Chinese perspective, and so on and so forth. Another side you see selective, you know, um, you know quiet you know, area like social uh, issues, you know, or competition and, you know, subsidies. This real area China does not see that fits well with their preferences. And also you see that happens for maximized flexibility in rules, you know, or I would say practice or standards, you know. It's not really saying that you do that, uh, 
immediately by write down by hard law, but you, incrementally, you know, through project contracts, through practices, you you basically uploading uh, Chinese standards to or practice to the international level, including uh, the practice at domestic level institution, domestic level and CSCC and internationally. At the uh, and also they combine both hard law and soft law. MOU is the soft law, but you see hard law project contracts, but also free trade agreements, bilateral investment treaties, and so on and so forth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, let's see if we can go to uh, Professor Ramraj's question in the chat box. Uh, I don't know if you've all seen it just very quickly as alluded to by me. Uh, here's the question, I quote, I realize this isn't the central focus of the panel, but I wonder how you'd characterize disputes between local communities and investors or states. Should more attention be paid to access to community-based grievance and dispute resolution mechanisms. So good question. Who, who would like to try that on? Well, I could give a try, um, even though I'm not really um, specialized in community-based dispute resolution, but I would like just to attempt. Um, thank you for the question. Um, well, what I see is that, you know, uh, it might be, and I can foresee environmental and labor um, disputes arising out of, or maybe contingent to, or contaminate with um, investment disputes in Africa, which is quite, quite um, inevitable when you have the mass planning and mass infrastructural um, development in African states. Uh, it seems to me uh, from the Djibouti case experiences with where I have the privilege of act, um, acting as an expert witness, um, it seems to me that uh, in the Djibouti case that the environmental and labor issues is not really that obvious, but I can see uh, that in African states, in terms of, you know, when you are employing massive numbers of laborers uh, in building roads and bridges and highways, uh, that will be uh, more um, of a concern. Um, so I would see that perhaps in the long run, um, if you really want to build up a, a BI dispute resolution mechanism, that sh uh, and I agree that certain attention should be given to uh, community-based grievances and how this area of dispute resolution concerns can be uh, uh, properly reflected. Um, yeah, that's just my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 yes, Dr. Dimsey? I will be brief because I'm sure Professor Wang has a much more um, founded um, approach to what, what um, this point entails. But just from my um, perspective, there's been a couple of cases not involving um, the BRI um, disputes in Africa, but involving South America, Bolivia for one, and also a couple of, um, I believe they were American cases with human rights on the one hand and access to water on the other. And those were cases that made it to ICSID eventually, but you saw in the procedural history and, and just the general factual background that there had been efforts at a local level, but for whatever reason, these efforts had been marginalized or not regarded as important enough and that was basically the, the trigger that sent it off to international dispute resolution settlement. So the short answer to the question, in my opinion, um, is that there does need to be more attention paid to it because I really do think that in a lot of these environmental access to, to fundamental utility kind of cases that you see that the dispute resolution or the dispute avoidance efforts at the beginning of the case were quite inadequate. So maybe there needs to be a more concerted effort there. Great. Great. And Professor Wong, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I just want to add a footnote to Professor Gu and also Dr. Dimsey. That's, I think that shows the this, this uniqueness of BRI projects uh, uh, of the strong and long-term distributive implications. You know, when you see how the road are designed uh, along uh, a, a state, you know, how people access that, how do you provide uh, protection for indigenous group and so on and so forth. Um, I think it's crucial to uh, protect vulnerable uh, groups and also to enable a uh, process like the public participation. I think action speaks louder as uh, they'll be very useful for provide leg legitimacy for the projects and to do uh, diffuse to address the potential concerns in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can sneak in one more question at least. Uh, um, so Li Xia Zhao had the next question uh, regarding one stop shop approach that uh, the combination of mediation arbitration, which China and other countries in Asia have been applying, what do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of this compared to traditional 
dispute resolution mechanisms. Would anybody like to take that on? Um, well, I think the question is more uh, more directed to me, so I would just yeah, probably uh, yes. Yeah, thank you, Professor Alpha, and thank you to. Um, uh, Miss Lee or Mr. Lee, I mean, for the question, uh, which I think is a very good question. Uh, the advantages are quite obvious. It's consolidation of resources. Um, it's consolidation of expertise, and there's it's pr probably so, sort of, you know, um, providing institutional ready-made um, resources platforms uh, to provide a one-stop um, service platform or service package for potential disputants and dispute resolution lawyers. So that's about advantages. Disadvantages is that um, if I can go back and to echo some of the points and arguments by Professor Wang Han is, you know, it's not really maximized flexibility. Like, you know, SICC, SIAC and their SIMC tr um, trinity, agglomeration trinity is that you can't go beyond uh, SIAC and SIMC. So you have to go within the jurisdiction of Singapore. So it's pretty much a Singapore government oriented top down um, dispute resolution efforts to consolidate all the Singapore dispute resolution services providers. So if say parties, they would like to go to Malaysia or Kuala Lumpur um, to choose Asian international arbitration centers, uh, arbitration services, but go back to use uh, the Singapore International Commercial Court, then probably this is not really available under the Singapore government's uh, approach. So um, in the words, I mean, um, the disadvantages is lack of maximized flexibility, but the advantages is really consolidation of uh, resources and expertise. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments on that? If not, we'll try to, I'm told I can sneak in one more. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Dimsey. I'll just be very brief on this because I had this come up in a recent case. One thing you need to be mindful of in these consolidated approaches. Yes, I fully agree that they bundle resources, but you also need to be aware of the confines of the local procedural law. I know, for example, in Hong Kong, if you have an ARB med ARB arrangement, um, the arbitration ordinance prescribes that if you have any confidential information that comes out in a caucus that's relevant for the dispute and the mediation fails, then you have to disclose it to the other party if it goes back to arbitration. So those kind of things, I mean, obviously this would be something that would be raised at the time, but this was something that, that was new to me when it came up. So that's that's something that you also need to keep in mind in, in trying to sculpt these arrangements. Thank you. Yes, that's a very important caveat. Um, so our last question before uh, we turn to Xiaying for concluding is uh, from Ngozi. And he asks, uh, what do you make of China's recent appointment of four African judges uh, into the uh, ICC. I guess, uh, Ngozi, this is the uh, experts, the second tranche of experts that uh, Professor Wu referred to. Uh, to, to yes. For African judges to adjudicate disputes arising from implementation of BRI contracts. So I guess that goes also first to Professor Gu, but anybody else can comment as well. Maybe uh, get Professor Kidani to comment as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Alpha, and thank you, um, should I pronounce the name, uh, Nazi, or? <laughs> thank you for your question. Um, well, my instinct is that, you know, to enhance legitimacy um, of the CICC dispute resolution involving African parties. Uh, I think the CICC and the SBC is quite aware that in light of the BRI expansion, there will be more cases um, concerned with the African parties. Uh, like you have already seen state investment disputes, I mean, the ICS provisions and investment treaty disputes involving Nigeria and Ghana. And then it's very likely that will be invested investor disputes. I mean, private international disputes between Chinese companies and African companies. Uh, a lot of this um, now so far, um, if you had not had African um, legal experts joining the ICC committee, that will be making a very bad impression uh, to the whole world as well as, as, well as the BRI um, member states that, you know, it's, it's very biased, pro-China uh, or pro-Asia. But now having four leading experts from Africa will make the decision uh, process more um, nuanced, more um, legitimate, and that will increase, um, I think, um, you can say it's diversity as well. Um, so I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on that? 
Okay, thank you all. It was a great panel and a lot of fun to do this with you. And now I think we turn to uh, uh, Dr. Sha Ying for concluding comments. Thank you. Uh, thanks. First of all, I want to thank all the speakers and participants in the three panels and those from CCPL and CAPI who have helped arranging this wonderful event, especially my co-convener Nigosi, as well as Winnie and, and John. I'd also want to take the chance to thank my doctoral supervisor, Professor William Alford, and my longtime uh, mentor, Professor Deborah Brodigan, who have contributed enormously to fostering the research on China-Africa engagements at Harvard, John Hopkins, and beyond. In my brief concluding remarks, I will simply reiterate some of the themes that have run through all the three panels. The first thing is the heterogeneity of actors on both sides, which are often generalized as China and Africa in popular accounts. Disaggregating the different motivations, capacity, and development visions of those actors is important to not only the truth-seeking mission of scholars, but also guiding the formulation and implementation of rules and policies governing China-Africa interactions. For the Chinese government and business actors, understanding the distinct socio-political conditions in African countries, especially the elective democracy, and the role of media and NGOs is key to ensuring their economic success and also the success of China's quest for soft power overseas. And I will refer to one survey result as an example. In recent years, China has doubled down its economic cooperation with Kenya in East Africa, especially through the financing and construction of the Mombasa Nairobi standard gauge railway. However, survey of public opinions shows that China's popularity among Kenyans has actually declined over the past five years. And one likely explanation is the critical coverage by international and Kenyan media of misgovernance of the railway project, including uh, the lack of transparency as Professor Alfred has mentioned during the negotiation stage of the project, the conflicts of legal culture and development ideologies and a more provocative debt trap diplomacy theory. Even though some of those allegations have proven to be misconception, it still suggests that the Chinese actors face a steep learning curve in understanding the difference between home and host environment in order to make the country's long-term strategies succeed in BRI countries. And for African policymakers, understanding the preferences of and dynamics among Chinese government agencies, state-owned banks, and corporations is also crucial to building the former's leverage in international negotiations and to harnessing greater benefits from investments flowing from China and other countries. And for example, Professor Qin Kuan Li has made a very powerful argument that the Chinese state capital can be more willing to accommodate local interests in Africa such as labor's demands than global private capital because the former is driven by non-economic objectives such as long-term energy security for China and the nation's international reputation. And in addition, two general strategies have been highlighted by our speakers for leveraging Chinese government and business actors. And those are regionalism and civil society activism. For instance, many have proposed that bringing the current bilateral ne trade negotiations between China and African countries under the framework of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement will open up more space for African countries to negotiate consistent standards on labor and environmental protection. And our second panel on transparent governance also shows that despite widespread pessimism, NGOs can and have indeed played a greater role in imp improving the transparency and social responsibility of Chinese companies. My own research in East Africa also suggests that civil society activism has a higher chance of success in the China-Africa context if the non-government actors are able to link local mobilization with transnational campaigns and broader interests of the international community and can move more flexibly in combining different strategies ranging from confrontation to engagement. 
And finally, and this has been emphasized by speakers from the last panel, that forward-looking and adaptive approaches are necessary as the BRI continues to unfold amid the fast-changing international environment. From the perspective of dispute resolution, there is competition, cooperation, and mutual learning between the existing international legal system and the emerging rules and institutions in China. Will China become a more Western-like investor as its economic stakes grow in Africa and beyond? Or will China, as Professor Wang argues, start uploading more Chinese norms and characteristics to the international order? This is a question that goes beyond the issue of dispute resolution, but underlies many other aspects of the BRI, such as international development finance, corporate social responsibility, and sustainable development. As an old saying, and as Professor Albert kept reminding me during my doctoral studies, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. We are very privileged to see vibrant discussions and different opinions on those issues during the past three days. And I'm sure that we will continue those important conversations in the future. And once again, thank you all for your participation. And this conference is now officially concluded. Thank you. Thank you, Ying. Thank, thank you again. Thank you, Ngozi. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.